Hello again everybody and welcome back to Fujits Blitz and this is a bit of a special video. Yes, it's a history video, but we're not going to be looking at just one tank, but a swapping five tanks. That's right, and no, the Challenger 2, which is what you're seeing, is not one of them. We're going to be looking at the German E-series of tanks. Before we get into that though, we need to look at a brief history of the tank itself. The idea behind some form of armoured vehicle has been around for some time. Think siege towers like you're seeing or even battering rams. Leonardo da Vinci even designed some form of armoured vehicle and so did HG Wells. But the tank as we know it actually started life as an artillery tractor somewhere between 1904 and 1909. Now, the British Army, whilst they liked the idea, weren't really sold on it. And they really asked for something that wasn't towing something, but could carry its own artillery gun. An idea that wasn't actually taken up. Now, armoured cars were already around and in military service, but these are not tanks. These are just cars and or lorries that had, had some armour shoved onto them. And their major downside being that they had a lack of mobility over rough terrain. I mean, armoured cars were great if you're on the road or in the desert, but over trenches or through swampy ground, they're really not that great. The other drawback with armoured cars, well, its main drawback, was that they used wheels. And with the addition of the extra armour, this created a weight ratio issue. In other words, it reduced the traction on the wheels. One way to combat this, well, one idea to combat this, was to actually add more wheels, thus spreading the weight. Problem was, this led to bigger vehicles, which led to more weight. So, in order to combat that, the idea was, well, why don't we just remove the armour, which kind of defeated the object. Now, it's fair to say that before we got the first real tank, it went through a few teething problems with their designs. I mean, think of crazy, crazy designs. And, you know, somebody's put it forward as a tank. The army were very lukewarm on the issue and eventually stored on the project. But where the army dropped it, the Royal Navy picked it up and created something called a landship committee. The aim of this committee was to develop something using naval knowledge. And what they came up with was something called Little Willy. This is the very first known prototype tank, as we know tanks. Little Willy was basically a box design atop some caterpillar tracks, which had recently been developed to actually overcome the wheel issue I mentioned earlier. Because the caterpillars distributed the weight more effectively, allowing for better traverse over this rough terrain. Little Willy, however, had no armament, but it did or it was proposed to carry either a machine gun or a two pound Navy anti-aircraft gun. Ironically, at this stage, because the Royal Navy were dealing with it, the vehicles were called land ships. They weren't even called armored fighting vehicles, let alone tanks. With the production of Little Willy, the British Army had a rekindled interest in the project and they now got actively involved in the concept and looking at it they required numerous changes primarily around the armor and the armament these additional changes led to a complete redesign of little willy which led to the mark one the tank that we that first saw action in world war one the army also didn't like the name landship firstly it was far too navyish and secondly it defeated any type of secrecy that may have surrounded it so they come up with the idea of calling them water containers. But some clever fellow in the ministry worked out if you call it water container, it'll be abbreviated to WC, which in English means toilet. They then scratched their heads a little bit and decided to drop the container and put tank instead. So they would become known as water tanks, eventually dropping the, the word water, keeping the term tank. From there on, they would be known officially as tanks. Interestingly, whilst it is common to call German tanks tanks, they're not. Only the World War I German vehicles are called tanks. All remaining German vehicles are termed Panzer, which actually doesn't mean tank. It actually means coat of mail. Think along the lines of chain mail. 
Initially, tanks were just that, a box-like structure that resembled a water tank with some caterpillar tracks slopped on the side and either a machine gun or small artillery anti-aircraft guns placed on it somewhere. And this box type design would be f the favoured design used by all nations realistically up until World War II. The basic concept behind the tank was armour, that was it, and it was to offer protection from small arms fire. It was therefore the norm to design tanks in this box type manner because they would be impervious to small arms fire. However, this design wasn't exactly ideal, especially when we started getting into World War II and nothing drives innovation better than war, leading to advances in weaponry specifically designed to combat the tank and defeat its armor. Because tanks were initially designed to combat small arms fire, they were actually lightly armored. They weren't overly mobile and they didn't have massive guns. They were there to punch holes and support the infantry, basically. So the box type armor was perfectly sufficient. The thing was, as the war progressed, numerous weapons were being introduced that easily penetrated these tanks. This then led to increasing the thickness of the armor. This resulted in more weight, meaning bigger tanks. For example, compare the Panzer I to that of the Panzer IV. The Soviets themselves also struggled with this issue. I mean, their early tanks, like the PT-7, were very, very lightly armored and very quick. Because they're easily combated, this led to them designing the KV-1, a boxy, heavy tank. But then the Russians came up with something that would change everything regarding tank design, namely the T-34. What the T-34 brought was considered to be a game changer. Nobody had realistically thought of it before. Basically, the idea behind the T-34 was to reduce the weight and reduce the overall cost without sacrificing the armor. In order to do this, the Russian tank designers sloped the armor at about 55 degrees. This had the effect of increasing the thickness of the armor by a whopping 100%. Thus, 100 millimeter thick flat armor would now be 200 millimeters thick armor without any increase in weight or thickness. This was a massive breakthrough that eventually led the Germans to reconsider their overall tank designs after facing and studying the T-34s and rush through the Panther tank. The first German Panzer to have sloped armor similar to that of the T-34. Furthermore, Following on from the Panther, the Germans also went back and redesigned the Tiger, which the initial Tiger one was a very boxy design, and they incorporated the Panther's sloped armor. This resulted in the Tiger II. It was during these phases that the Germans also realized something else. Unlike the Soviets, which only really had one company designing and making tanks, although they had numerous factories, because under communism, everything is owned by the state, Germany had numerous competing companies all designing completely different types of panzers, none of which were standard or interchangeable. This was set to change, however. The German Armaments Ministry, by 1944, thought it was better now to have a standard series of panzers leading to the E-series. The E in the E series actually stands for Entwicklung, which means development, but it also fits nicely with the English word experimental. The concept behind the series was to create a standardized series of tank designs based upon differing weights and premises, or class, like tank destroyer, light tank, medium and heavy. There were five proposed tanks in the series in real life, of which four appear in the game World of Tanks Blitz. Yes, I know there are five in the game, but one of those is a fake imposter. But we'll get to that later. The E-Series also brought a way to reduce costs, make the design simpler, make them easier to produce, and make it more efficient in the production line. 
Not only that, but they're also meant to have interchangeable parts such as wheels, tracks and the like. Something the Germans did not have with any other class of tank to date, except the likes of if it was the same type of tank. Think Panzer III and Stug III. However, when you get to Panzer III and Panzer IV, they're not interchangeable. This would not only reduce production cost, speed up production and make things a lot easier for the Germans, it would also reduce the reliance on their quickly depleting resources. The E-Series itself contained all classes of tanks, light, medium, heavy, TD, and they even considered a super heavy tank. These tanks were proposed to replace the tanks that were in current service. Minor improvements, yes, but not major improvements as such, with the exception of the super heavy that was proposed. Now, there is no evidence to suggest that the E-Series would increase the armor or firepower of the overall designs. They only offered minor improvements to what was currently in service. The first tank in the E-Series is that of the E-10 class. This was developed as a replacement to the Jagdpanzer 38T, which is incorrectly termed the Hetzer. Now, the E-10 proposed tank was officially called the Hetzer, whereas the Jagdpanzer 38T only had the unofficial name Hetzer that had been given to it by the troops because it means beta and it was a small nippy little tank. The reason it was termed E-10 was because this class of tank was to weigh between 10 and 24 tons and it was intended to be a tank destroyer. It was meant to be a total replacement to the Jagdpanzer 38T Hetzer. No E-10s were ever produced however, not even a wooden mock-up and the only evidence we have that these tanks were about to be done are some rough drawings of its concept art. The next tank in the E-Series is the E-25. Now the E-25 is an interesting one. This was actually meant to be the mainstay and the main battle tanks for the German forces. And it was initially intended to replace the Panzer III and Panzer IV medium tanks with the weight class being between 25 and 49 tons, hence the term E-25. It was considered that all types of medium roll vehicles should and will be considered, including tank destroyers, and it was proposed that the Jagdpanther series and Stugs would be effectively replaced by this tank. The main armament was meant to be the effective 75mm Pack 42 l 70 a gun that was used on the Panther, and it was going to be standardised for all the medium tanks in the series. Like the E-10, this tank never made it past concept design drawing. Not only that, the only concept they did design was the replacement for the Jagdpanzer series. They didn't even get around to designing the replacement for the Panzer III or Panzer IV. Following on from the E-25 and moving up a weight class, we have the E-50. The E-50 was a medium tank in the weight class of 50 to 74 tons and was initially considered as a direct replacement to the Panther tank. The thing is, the Panther itself had undergone a redesign early in 1943, which resulted in the Panther II, a tank that was based upon the Tiger II hull which led many people to believe that the E-50 was more akin to the Tiger II than it was the Panther, although I think that's probably misunderstanding, because there is also an argument that the Panther II hull was actually the prototype for the E-50, but more about that in a moment. Here, there are some concept design drawings of the proposed E-50, which does bear a resemblance to the Tiger II, albeit slightly smaller with a hull and Henschel turret. Now, many have presumed that the Schmalterm turret would have been used, but there is no evidence to actually support this. There is a lot of misunderstanding as to what the Schmalterm turret was going to be used for, with many thinking it was the Panther II's turret, although it is now considered that it was basically an upgrade turret to the Panzer IV-J and the Panzer Alf F, which was the final version of the Panther design meant to incorporate the 88mm gun, but due to resource issues and other delays, plus the war coming to an end, the Alsef never got finished. 
with only a few halls being completed, along with a few Schmaltern turrets found in the same location, which has led many to believe that it was meant to be the Aus F turret. According to German records, however, the Panther II had a single prototype and was eventually merged into the E-50 project. So it has led some to believe reasonably that the Panther II and the E-50 are one in the same. Unfortunately, only one Panther II hull was ever made. This was eventually captured by the Americans, whereby they fitted a Panther G turret uh, atop of it to give it a completed look. It's actually really difficult to say with any certainty what the E-50 turret would have actually looked like. Would it have been the planned Panther F Schmauter or similar to the Henschel Tiger II turret? Either way, a medium tank with the characteristics of a Tiger II would have certainly been a fearsome beast. Now, whilst there are no surviving photos or records of the E-50 as such, it did make it to a wooden mock-up stage. Many believe now that because the Panther II project merged to the E-50 project, that the only Panther II hull ever made is in fact that of the E-50. This, however, cannot be the case because the Panther II hull was produced in 1943, long before the E-Series project commenced in 1944. Now, it is correct to say that the Panther II project was eventually cancelled and merged into the E-50 project, but it is most likely that the Panther II hull was to serve as a base for the E-50 rather than as the E-50 hits south. Next in line, we have the E-75. Now, the E-75 was a proposed heavy tank to replace the Tiger II with a weight class of 75 to 99 tonnes. The E-75 itself was meant to share the same production line as the E-50 and, comparatively, they are exactly the same tank, albeit the E-75 had thicker armour, leading to the increased weight. Makes sense, kind of. There is also an indication that the planned gun, the 88mm AU-71, was to be upgraded to the 88mm AU-100, a very long gun indeed. Some sources even go further to say that the tank would have had the 105mm gun. Um, and as such, it could never have had the Schmaltern turret, because that turret is far too narrow to accommodate such a gun. It could only be accommodated in the Tiger II Henschel turret or production turret. Again, there are no actual E75s ever produced, and it never went past the concept drawing stage. All we have to go on is the initial concept art, being an upgrade based on the Tiger II, and that's about it. It had the similarities to that of a Panther II E50 with the similarities of a Tiger II, just with more armour and a potentially bigger gun. Last in the series is that of the E100. This is the super heavy of the series, and this is the final tank in the series. It had a weight class of between 100 to 130 tons. Now, many believe, including a lot of sources such as Wikipedia, that this was the proposed replacement to the mouse tank, which is a Porsche design. That is not the case. The mouse, as I said, a tank designed by Porsche, was a completely different tank in a much heavier weight class, that of between 150 to 200 tons. The actual prototype, which sits in Kabinka, by the way, is 188 tons. Not only that, the Porsche mouse differed in many other respects, not just the overall look, but also the engine, the drivetrain, the wheels, the tracks, everything. The E100, however, was actually intended as a replacement to a tank called the Krupp Tiger Mouse, which was a conversion of the Mushen project or Mauschen project, I apologise for my German. It was a lot smaller than the Porsche Mouse, but it did incorporate many aspects of the Tiger I, such as the road wheels and the tracks. Krupp, however, lost out in the Mouse project to Porsche, who then went on to build the Mouse, and the Tiger Mouse was eventually cancelled, but it wasn't killed off. When the E-Series came about, Krupp, however, had moved on so the project went to a company called Alder, 
who reworked the Krupp Tiger Mouse by reducing the weight from 130 tons to that of 100 tons, and thus the E100 concept was born. Now, the E100 was the only E-series tank to actually start production, with the hull being partially completed. Whilst there are blueprints that survive, there is only a rough indication as to what the E100 would actually look like overall. The British managed to capture the only hull produced, and when reviewing this along with the blueprints, it caused quite some confusion. The blueprints show both the mouse one turret as seen on the prototype mouse, but also a redesigned mouse two turret, which is what many believe the E100 would have had. The reasoning behind this is that the mouse turret weighs in excess of 50 tons, whereas the E100 hull could not mount such a heavy turret. The drawings of the Mouse 2 turret, which is an upgraded and slimmed down version of the Mouse turret, came in at 35 tons. Thing is, no such turret was ever made, and the production team at Audler on the E100 project were not concerned with the turret because that fell upon Krupp, and Krupp had not moved forward on it. It's therefore a mystery as to what turret the E100 would have had, but we do know it would not have been the mouse version due to its weight. But, in, but we also know it needed to be a pretty big turret because the proposed gun was 128 mm Concepts and models have erred on the side of the proposed mouse 2 turret, which was never built, and there does exist blueprints in the form of drawings designed by Krupp in late 1944 as a replacement and upgrade to the initial mouse turret. And it does look like the boxy turret seen in almost, ren almost every render of the E100, including the models. But we'll never know. Unfortunately, the E100 chassis were completely destroyed by the Allies after the war um, and sold for scrap eventually. So we'll never know much about this tank. Last on the list is the Ringer, the one that doesn't exist, the imposter, that is the E50M. The E50M is a totally fabricated tank. It never existed in real life, either in concept or consideration. It does make a showing in the game World of Tanks and World of Tanks Blitz, and the E50M is the successor to the E50. The justification being that the E50 design was modified whereby the transmission was moved towards the rear. On the grounds that no E50s were ever built, such a design change would not have resulted in a redesignation of the tank. It would still remain the E50. It's merely a creative and artistic license being employed by the game developers in order to give a natural succession in the game to their tier system. Nothing more than that. Even if the E50M, which never existed, did exist, it would be exactly the same as the E50. No increased armor, no different weapons, nothing. It would just be exactly the same. The only difference being the transmission from the front to the rear. And with that, I have been Fujit. That has been quite a lengthy video, I agree, but we've covered a lot of tanks. And we also looked at a brief history of how the tank came about. By all means, comment everything below. If you want to press like, it's a nice thing to do. Big shout out to my Patreons and YT members. Without you, these videos would be a lot harder to make. And to all my subscribers, who without you, these videos would be pointless. Till the next time, I will say my usual. Stay safe out there, have fun on the battlefield, and happy tanking, because that is what it's all about. Having fun and being happy.